Good morning, Christian Chapel. My name is Chris. I'm the pastor here at Christian Chapel, and I'm thrilled that you're joining us for this message series. It's called Inheritance, Stories That Shape Us. This summer, we're exploring some of the stories from the Old Testament of men and women who had big, bold faith, incredible adventures with God, and we're seeing that these are not just stories we read, but these are our spiritual ancestors. They've shared this inheritance with us through Christ. So no matter what family you were born into, no matter what your circumstances of life might have been, these are the ones who've gone before you and who they were is now who you are through Jesus Christ. This morning, we're gonna hear from Pastor Chris Godfrey and Pastor Lauren Gankars. It's gonna be a fun morning where they team teach for us about the story of David and the inheritance of worship that he has left for us. Will you please join me in welcoming Pastor Chris and Pastor Lauren this morning. Thank you very much. It's so good to be here in service with all of you. And just want to uh, reiterate, thank you for giving to RFK, for serving, for praying. I believe that many campers' uh, lives were touched last week. And so we're thankful for that. That was an awesome video. There was a sermon in that video. So just really appreciate uh, that. So yes, I'm Chris Godfrey, the executive pastor. Lauren Gankar is a worship pastor here at Christian Chapel. And we are going to tag team. We would duet, but we promised our spouses and our boss that we would not do that. So sorry, you're, you're not going to get that this morning. Yes. I'm oh, sorry. I thought you were still talking. So I was just enjoying that moment. Um, my turn. So good morning. My name is Lauren. I'm the worship pastor here. I do have some pretty detailed notes because speaking like this is not something that I normally do. Um, so thank you for being a gracious congregation this morning to me. Um, today we're continuing our message series, Inheritance, where we explore the inheritance we have received from men and women in the Old Testament. And so far, Pastor Chris... Dow, not Godfrey, has shared with us about uh, Noah, a man who walked faithfully with God. Uh, how, like Noah, we can reject the inheritance of violence and corruption and instead live out an inheritance of righteousness. And then on Father's Day, Pastor Chris talked about Abraham, how we've received an inheritance of faith from him and how Abraham's faith can be our faith as well. And then last week, Pastor Chris talked about Joseph, how all the setbacks in his life were actually setups for what God was about to do. And like Joseph, we've inherited the favor of God, and we can be sure God is at work in our lives like God was at work in Joseph's life. Yes, so this week uh, we are going to talk about David, uh, King David, and the importance of worship. And so the title of this sermon is David the Worshipper. And uh, for both of us, worship has been an important aspect of our lives. Um, I uh, remember being six years old and singing specials in church. I don't know if what kind of church you grew up in, but for me, uh, the pastor would get up after the song service and he would say, uh, does anyone in the church have a special that they want to sing? And I was always prepared to be able to go up there and to sing. So it, it started yeah. early and it continued. And I, I think what's awesome is how God, um, even from a young age, just begins to prepare you for what he has in store for you. Because I really didn't even think that being a worship pastor was on the radar for me. In fact, when I started ministry, I was a youth pastor. I know that's hard to, to believe uh, when I, uh, the fun went way downhill, the older that I got. But I used to be fun, I promise. <laughs> But um, not anymore. But I, I was. I was a youth pastor for four years, and it went pretty well, uh, I think. But while I was there, the, the last two years, they needed somebody to also fill the role of worship pastor. So because I could play keys and because I sang in my background, um, I accepted that. And then it went on to about 12 years of full-time uh, worship leading. And then when I was a worship leader, God continued to prepare me for what was next because he laid other responsibilities um, into my lap that I began to do for the church. That was just an open door for what I was going to do here. So so God's faithful. I know that really doesn't have anything to do with worship, but just a nugget there that God is looking out for you, no matter how young or old you are, he's preparing you for what's next and he's going to be there for you. Yeah. Amen. Thanks for that. I'm going to get us started this morning uh, with our first couple of main points. Um, when Pastor Chris Dow asked me to team preach with 
old Godfrey over there. Um, I was surprised, pleasantly. Um, I'm so excited. I love this church family. I'm honored to speak, um, but I don't have a, a ton of it. Well, so a couple of years ago, I was asked to preach in Chapel Youth when we were between youth pastors, and um, that's a rough crowd. <laughs> Just have to say. <sighs> I was like, some of these jokes would have killed downstairs, okay? Um, and I've spoken at a couple of women's events. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm very experienced, actually, now that I think of it. That's, oh, and I preached in first service today. So, okay. So here we are. Uh, no, today we're going to explore David and the inheritance we've received from him to be worshipers. Uh, a little bit about me. Worship has been part of my life from my earliest memories. Uh, my parents were musicians. My dad was the worship pastor here at Christian Chapel for 10 or 12 years. And uh, I used to ask him, can I go early with you in the morning? And, and so I would come and I'd sit in the front row and I'd listen to the whole worship practice. And then I'd stay for one or sometimes two services. And uh, so it was just part of our regular life. It was like worship was part of, of who we were as a family. Um, before that, my grandparents, I, I had a grandpa who sang tenor in the church choir, and uh, his wife, my Mimi, could play any hymn by ear in any key. You know what I mean? She could just go up there and just do it. She was amazing. Um, in fact, I didn't share this with first service, but in, in later in life, she was really stricken with Alzheimer's and really couldn't remember any of us or any details, but she could sing, hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Not kidding. She could sing that hymn when she couldn't remember anything else. Um, also, my granddad, my, my dad's dad used to lead hymns for the teenagers Sunday school here. So worship's a big part of my personal heritage. Um, as a little girl, I would pretend to be the worship leader. We would play worship leader, uh, me and my friends. I'm Gwen, and you're Carol, and we'll I'm sorry, most of you, those names don't mean anything, but they did to us. And so I would perch up on the fireplace and use a little fake microphone, and I would sing songs like As the Deer and Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. You know that one? Be Bold. I'm really throwing it back there to the 80s. Anybody? Be Bold. Um, and it was good times. By middle school, I was either running the lyrics on the overhead projector for youth group. Old tech alert. <laughs> overhead projector, um, or singing background vocals behind my sister Jamie and youth group. Uh, of course, this is the 90s, so special music, you know, it was the thing. And Pastor Chris Godfrey already talked about this. So, you know, there weren't many songs by Point of Grace that I did not own the track to and sing in front of people. I'm sure, I'm sorry, if you were here those years, I should have thrown in some other bands probably. Needed a little bit of variety. No, but it was good times. I loved all that. But even though obviously music's been a big part of my life, worship is a heritage that all of us can enjoy to be worshipers because we get that from David. Um, before there was modern worship artists and bands like Maverick City Music and Elevation Worship, there was David. And if you want me to throw it back more, uh, before there was Chris Tomlin and Darlene Check, there was David. And if that's still not doing it for you, um, before Isaac Watts and Charles Wesley, there was David. He was the OG of worship. Um, so who was David? David is the son of Jesse, the youngest of eight sons. I only have five boys. I cannot imagine what that mom just went through on a day-to-day -day basis alarming. Um, David was also an ancestor of Jesus. He's uh, known for killing Goliath with a sling and a stone. He's probably every little boy's favorite Bible hero. You know, we love to hear about little David coming up and beating Goliath. Um, when he was a boy, his family is visited by a prophet named Samuel. And Samuel has been instructed by God to visit the house of Jesse and to anoint one of his sons as king. Of course, everyone's thinking it's probably going to be the oldest son. If not the oldest, maybe the second oldest. But no, God says no, 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 all the way down to David is the one that God chose. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, it says, The Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, speaking of the older brother, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 
And that's good news. That's good news for anybody who is not at the top of the pyramid, right? The Lord looks at the heart, not at the outward things. David is also known for uh, being a musician to King Saul, with whom he fell in and out of favor during King Saul's uh, life. And the scriptures say his music soothed Saul when he was being tormented by evil spirits. And you know, I could have used some of David's music last time I was at the dentist, and then maybe I wouldn't have needed the therapy dog. And I wish that was a joke. It's okay. It happened, and I'm, it's okay. I'd rather laugh than cry about it. Um, ultimately, uh, David seceded King Saul as the king of Israel, right? Okay. You can read more about David's life in detail in First and Second Samuel. It's a great read. Of course, David, I alluded to earlier, wrote hymns and songs of worship, which make up a very large portion of the book of Psalms. So my first main point this morning is that through David, we learn that worship is an exercise for every believer in every season. Okay. Worship is for every believer. David wasn't a perfect man, okay? He didn't lead a sinless life. In fact, the opposite. He struggled with a major moral fail failure in his life, uh, committing adultery with Bathsheba, and then later sending her husband Uriah to the front lines to be killed. I mean, it was some bad choices upon bad choices, right? Some serious lapse in judgment. He struggled with sin. David was not perfect. Yet the scriptures describe him like this in Acts 13, 22. After removing Saul, he made David their king and he testified con concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He's a man after God's own heart. In spite of his sin and imperfection, David worshiped freely and we should as well. What I love about David is his life breaks through the lie that you're not worthy to worship God because of something that you've done because of some sin you've committed, because of some mistake you've made. Um, that's just not true. That's from Satan. That's a lie. You are worthy to worship God because there is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus. The veil was torn. Jesus is now available to us. We are able to come to him and worship with repentant hearts, yes, but we don't have to be perfect. David wasn't perfect. We don't have to be perfect either. Worship is for every believer. Worship is also for every season. David worshiped as both a shepherd and a king. He worshiped as a young man and an old man. And he worshiped in triumph and defeat. So as a shepherd and a king, for us that looks like we are worshipers when we're students and entry-level interns and CEOs. We are worshipers at the bottom of the ladder and at the top. Uh, as a young man and an old man. For us, that looks like we worship as children, teens, young adults, middle-aged, advanced age, and even to our deathbeds. Kind of like I mentioned my, um, my grandmother earlier, such an inspiration. Um, and I want to give Pastor Amy a shout out here. She does such a wonderful job teaching our children songs about Jesus, teaching them to be worshipers. One of my twins, who's six, he loves to sing that song, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do, right? But while he does it, he uses these little five pound weights and pumps to the beat of the music. And I just, I need to freeze him in time is really what it is. It is so adorable. And I just think he, he, it's not even probably thinking about what he's singing, but that song is so deep down in his heart and in his spirit, and that truth is just with him. I, I love that. So David also worshiped in triumph and in defeat. So for, for us, that looks like uh, when we get the promotion, when we have success, when we pay off the house, when we experience God's favor, and when we see dreams fulfilled in that high mountaintop season, we worship the Lord. And that also looks like worshiping in the most difficult seasons of life, loss, heartache, death of a loved one, seasons of waiting, seasons where we don't understand God's hand in something. We still come, we still worship the Lord. He's still worthy of our praise, amen? Even in the low times of life. 
The beautiful thing about worship is it lifts our eyes off our current circumstances and places them on Christ. It shifts our focus, right? In Psalm 28, 7, David writes, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Come on. Those, that's an encouragement. We sing these songs of worship. We can sing the Psalms that David wrote. They encourage our heart. So when we worship, we don't have to use flowery words and lofty speech. We can come to God with that raw kind of honesty. And I think it took me a while to realize that. I think as a little girl and even maybe teenager, maybe even into college years, I kind of felt like if I'm praising, if I'm praying, if I'm um, talking to the Lord, it needs to be, you know, very just right up biblical, um, a little formal, uh, a little, uh, you know, Lord, I know you have a plan, even though I'm falling apart inside or whatever it is. And I think what I've learned through David is we can come to God with honesty. Lord, what the heck is going on right here in my life, right? Um, We can come to him and just pour our hearts out. Uh, David says in Psalm 69, one, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. If David prayed prayers like that, if David sang songs like that, we can come to God with that same kind of raw honesty. Does that make sense? Yeah. Worship is for every season. It's our inheritance from David. My second main point this morning is that through David, we learn to worship with expression. I did a little jazz hand there. Took me back to show choir. Whitney knows. Um, Sorry. I know that some of us expressive Pentecostals in the room are just going to love this whole point. You're going to be like, preach it, which honestly, I don't know if any of you are here right now because I got a lot more response in first service. Um, David described worship as singing, playing instruments, clapping, dancing, right? Lifting our hands. It was a physical expression. Worship was something that we did. It's more than a posture of the heart. It is a posture of the heart. It all starts in the heart. That's so important, but it's more than that, okay? It's a physical expression with God, for God. And I felt like the Lord gave me a picture just this morning of like a bottle of soda. If it was at our house, it would probably be a Coke for my husband, Tom, or a Diet Dr. Pepper for me, which is neither here nor there. Now you know my favorite kind, in case you ever want to bless me. Um, But Worship, when we sing the truths of God, right, it's almost like we're shaking up that bottle and then we open it and it all bubbles out, right? So when we worship the Lord, when we sing the truths of who he is, we can't help but express with our bodies, with our mouths, with our voices, with our hands, our excitement, right? It starts in the heart, but it gets stirred up. As we worship the Lord, one time, I didn't mention this in first service, I sometimes will worship in my car when I'm driving, and there was a song, and I was just like, yes, Lord, you know what I mean? I think I had a hand raised, and my son, Brett, was like, mom, what in the world? I'm like, listen, I gotta let it out. You know what I mean? I just felt it in that moment. And I couldn't, I, I couldn't not worship the Lord. Have you ever been in that moment where you can't not worship him because something stirs in your heart and you have a physical response? And I think that happened to David as well. In fact, I know it did. The scriptures say in 2 Samuel 6, 14, David danced before the Lord with all his might. So we sing together, we lift our hands, we praise God, and each Sunday service, we do that intentionally. We don't have worship time as a space filler or as a warm-up for Pastor Chris. He doesn't need us, right? We're not doing it for that. We're not doing it to uh, be the intro band so we can get to the the main deal. We worship with intentionality because it's important It's important to spend time in worship before the Lord as a church body, corporately, singing these truths about Jesus together. Singing with believers is so powerful. Uh, And I mentioned this earlier, but when we use our mouths to sing and proclaim the truths of Christ, they become beliefs in our heart, right? So David writes in Psalm 29.2, and I think this is the prayer of my heart, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And that's what I want to do. 
That's what I want us as a church to do, to ascribe to the Lord the glory, do his name. He deserves it, right? And we're going to worship him in the splendor of his holiness. We're going to come. We're going to lift our hands. We're going to worship with expression because we can't keep it in, right? So that is the conclusion of my portion, and I'm going to hand it to Pastor Chris. And thank you, Pastor Lauren. Um, I'm going to continue uh, on the inheritance that David gives us, David the worshiper, um, by turning uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 16 is where I'll take my text. Um, it'll be on the screen, but if you want to follow along in your Bible as well, you can, 1 Samuel 16, verses 14 through 23. It says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendant said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you, and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, Find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem, uh, who knows how to play the lyre. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man. And I'll pause there to say that seems to be a prerequisite for worship leaders, right? Fine looking men. Sorry, I shouldn't do that while I read the scriptures, but, um, and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son, David, who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them with his son, David, to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse saying, allow David to remain in my service for I am pleased with him. Whenever the spirit from God came on Saul, David would take up the lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better and the evil spirit would leave him. And so this morning, I just want to continue by saying that I believe that there is a specific calling and anointing for worship leaders in the local church. And I am so glad for our worship leader. I'm glad for the worship team. I am so thankful that they are anointed from God week in and week out to lead us in corporate worship. Pastor Lauren already talked about how it's so important. We come together in unity. We lift our hands. We express our worship to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I believe that David has given us that inheritance and proves that it, there is a calling for that in the local church and for us to do it. And so this is why we do it. So in 1 Samuel 16, the part that I read there, the first 13 verses is the passage of scripture where um, Samuel the prophet had come to David and anointed him to be king. And so then the uh, passage of scripture that I read uh, talks about um, David's uh, ability to play music. And so um, the anointing of God's life upon David was primarily the main purpose, you could say, was to anoint him to be king. But here's the thing about the anointing. Uh, he wasn't king. It was a few more years before he would become king. And I don't even remember exactly the amount of years it was. But the anointing didn't wait to start manifesting the presence of the Lord in David and the abilities and the talents that he had. Um, the anointing flowed into David immediately when he was anointed to uh, for who he was at that point, for what was directly in front of him, and through his God-given talent. And so I could say to you this morning that whatever talents you have in life, you can worship God through them because God has anointed you with those talents to be able to serve him. And it just so happens that the talents that David had was number one in the passage. We hear that he was already known to be a mighty warrior. No doubt, probably some of the stories of David 
David being the shepherd protecting those sheep from the lions and the bears had been floating around. And this servant of Saul had heard that and knew that David was a mighty warrior. Another thing that he knew about David that had been going around is that David was very um, talented upon, with musical instruments and the ability to compose worship music. And so David didn't wait until he became king to be used of the Lord, but the anointing flowed through him immediately with the talents that he had. And so what is the anointing? Well, in the Old Testament, it specifically meant a prophet pouring oil over your head in a ceremony depicting that the favor of the Lord covered you and it set you apart for a work and empowered you to do that work. And that's why there's a lot of parallels uh, into the New Testament about the anointing of the Holy Spirit, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, covering us, setting us apart, anointing us to do what he has called us to do. And so this anointing had previously been upon Saul, but because of disobedience, it had been replaced with an evil spirit. Um, so God's anointing on David is seen through David's ability to play and compose worship music. So I believe that the text lets us know that worship leading and worship is a specific anointing from God that is for us today. It's an inheritance that we have. So in verse 18 of the text, the servant of Saul had heard about the young shepherd boy, his talents, and how that God was with him, proving that David was anointed to to play music and to, um, to compose it. David's example in the Old Testament provides biblical evidence that God honors and anoints worship and those he calls to lead. And I believe that he honors worship even today when we come into his presence. God is already here. He is everywhere. But when we begin to praise and worship him, it's almost just like you can just feel him close when we're here worshiping him uh, corporately or wherever we're at in our lives. He is there uh, with us. I'm sure there were other services servants in Saul's court who could play music. Um, when I read this passage, sometimes I like to think, well, why didn't they just use one of the musicians that were there? There were probably a lot of them. But this proves to me, again, that David was specifically anointed for this task. Um, God's anointing on David, my, my next point, is an example that worship through music is powerful. So that's why we do it week in and week out. Lauren already talked about we just don't do it as an opener. We don't do it because church would be awkward um, without it. We, it has a very, very specific purpose, and that is that it is powerful. So when David would play, verse 23, the evil spirit that had come upon Saul uh, would leave and Saul would find relief. And so I'm not trying to correlate that there's evil spirits that are within us, but I do want to correlate today that I still believe it's true that you, if you think of personal testimonies in your life, I mean, I've heard of, of um, saints of God. I've heard testimonies growing up where someone one would say, um, you know, I was washing the dishes or doing the laundry or mowing the lawn and I would just begin to worship. And um, the anxiety or what I was going through that day or the problems or the cares that I had in life, they would just begin to go away. And you probably have personal testimonies of that as well. Um, I like, I want to give a testimony of myself of here at Christian Chapel. There have been probably numerous times where there have been burdens on my life when I've come into to the worship service. And usually because of the tasks that I do here at the church, I'm usually about maybe two to three minutes late for the service. And so I'll walk in, music is already going. They're already singing up here, praising God. People are already worshiping him. And I'll walk down here to the seat that I usually sit in. And before I get there, um, whatever the burdens or the needs that I've had in my life, I already feel God close, the powerful presence and anointing of the Holy Spirit, uh, just beginning to take those things away and to move them uh, to the side so that I can fully worship God and think um, only of him. And so I find that that happens with us even 
today. A few weeks ago, I preached a message that our calling as a church is to go out and to witness. And I believe that our corporate worship here every single Sunday is a part of the power that we receive to be able to go out and do the work of the Lord. Um, I believe that corporate worship, joining together as a corporate body, week in and week out, is very important for our lives. We need each other and we need God. And when we worship him, God shows up always, and he is there for us. And then my last point is um, worship through music. Not only is it powerful, but it is a powerful weapon for every believer. So David was a man of war. That's what God needed from him when he was a king. When you read the, the story of David in First and Second Samuel, you're going to find that um, after he became king, or even before then, he was involved in war after war after war, fight after fight after fight. That was the purpose of his life. But through that purpose, worship was still at the very core of his heart. In fact, to the point that he was so worried and concerned that God did not have a um, good enough temple or a tabernacle for people to worship him. So he wanted to build this temple. But because uh, he was a man of war, God passed that down to Solomon, his son. But it proves David had worship in his heart through every fight, every battle that continued to be his battle cry and his weapon was worship. And so Psalm 144 is a passage of scripture that I want to read in closing together. Um, I'll read most of the chapter. You can read along with me, but I'm going to break it into five different parts um, really quickly, how I feel that David has given us an inheritance of how he used worship as a powerful weapon in his battles. So it starts off in the verse, first two verses uh, of Psalm 144. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, he sings, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle, he is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. So David, while preparing for war, the first thing that he does is he praises God Almighty for being his rock, for preparing him for battle, for training his fingers for war, for being a refuge, a place where David could hide. And we can do the same thing. And I'll stop here and say, our um, correlation with this is not going to be the same. Uh, we don't fight our battles with sword and with, with a spear like David did, but we do fight a spiritual battle. And uh, we fight a battle. One of the weapons that we have is worship. And so we can do that when we are about to go to war against the enemy of our souls. And we do it on a daily basis. Every time we begin to pray to the Lord every day for our children and our our grandchildren and for our family, that we can start with worship and that God, worship to God is a powerful weapon and he fights our battles for us. Uh, the second part, um, he, worship is a powerful weapon as we praise God for his mercy. Verses three and four, uh, David sings, Lord, what are human beings that you care for them? Mere mortals that you think of them, they are like a breath. Their days are like a fleeting shadow. So David understood that he was no one, that his abilities to fight, even his abilities to play music, they didn't matter to anything. They were all God-given and without God, he was nothing. But God in his mercy was always there for him. And it's the same for us today. We can say that to the Lord as we pray, God, I understand I'm nothing. I have sinned. Uh, my talents are not good enough. Uh, the things that I know how to do, I can't do these things on my own. But through you, everything is possible. Through you, you are all powerful. You fight my battles for me, and I can praise you and worship you for that. The third part, verses 5 through 8. Part your heavens, Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so that they smoke. 
Send forth lightning and scatter the enemy. Shoot your arrows and rout them. Reach down your hand from on high. Deliver me and rescue me from the mighty waters, from the hands of foreigners whose mouths are full of lies, whose right hands are deceitful. And so here we see praise and petition. These are a bunch of supernatural things that you just read here that just didn't happen on the norm. But when David praised and worshiped God through song, he believed that God would fight his battles in ways that he could not do himself. And that is still so true for us today. When we have things in our lives that we don't know what to do, when the waves seem like they're up to our neck, when the obstacles are all around us, we can worship and God shows up in supernatural ways for us. And the uh, fourth part, verses nine and 10. Um, I will sing a new song to you, my God. On the 10 stringed lyre, I will make music to you, to the one who gives victory to kings, who delivers his servant, David. And so again, praise is a powerful weapon. And he does that by singing new songs. And we do that today. We sing a new song to the Lord and God is there as we praise him. And then last but not least, uh, the last part, um, verses 12 through 15. Um, and I love this part because David understood that it just wasn't about him. God just wasn't for him, but God was for his family. God was for his children. God was for his spouse. God was for his grandchildren and generations to come. And we can hold on to this truth. And David sings, then our sons and their youth will be like well-nurtured plants. And our daughters will be like pillars carved to adorn a palace. Our barns will be filled with every kind of provision. Our sheep will increase by thousands, by tens of thousands in our fields. Our oxen will draw heavy loads. There will be no breaching of walls, no going into captivity, no cry of distress in our streets. Blessed is the people of whom this is true. Blessed is the people whose God is the Lord. And so even for us, uh, a lot of those things we might not find in common with what is in our lives, but I believe that God will bless our efforts. He will bless our jobs. He will bless our businesses. He will bless our finances. He will bless us when we uh, follow after him and we worship him. Praise is an awesome weapon. So this morning, will you stand with us as the worship team comes up? We are going to conclude this service like we do every single service, but we do it with purpose. And so this morning, I do want to let you know that we have a prayer team that is in the prayer room. If you don't know where that's at, you just walk out these two back doors and to your left, there's a sign that says the prayer room, a door with a glass there, and there'll be some chapel host that can help you find that room if you can't find it yourself. But in the prayer room, we have a prayer team that will pray with you about anything that you might be going through, any struggles, um, any anxiety, uh, anything, any burdens that you have, prayer for healing, prayer for your business, whatever it might be, they're there to help you pray. But for us this morning, uh, this is how I want us to respond. If you um, like David and the scripture that Lauren uh, read, find that the waters are up to your neck or those obstacles are all around you, worship this morning. When they sing this song, worship intentionally because there is power in worship and God shows up. Maybe this morning you, everything's going well. Uh, you don't have a burden or whatever. Continue to worship. You're gonna find strength for your week. And when something does come up, you're gonna have the strength to be able to endure it because the presence and the anointing of God will be with you. Um, you might be, uh, you might identify with David as someone who has fallen someone who sin and captivity and the chains of sin just keep, keep keeping you down. I said that three, keep three times, but it, you're, you're down, you're chained. You don't know how to get out of it. Worship. There's power in worship. We even saw the inheritance from David as it went to Paul and Silas when they were thrown into the prison. What did they do when they were in chains? They sang, they worship. So that's your inheritance this morning, Christian chapel. If that's where you're at, worship God this morning. And no matter where you're at, how young or old or what you're going through, I believe that you can um, worship God and that he will show up every time that you worship him because it is a powerful weapon. Let's praise and worship him together.
Hey, Christian Chapel family, I hope God is speaking to you through this message series, Inheritance, about who you are, the inheritance you received, and how it changes your life every day. If you'd like to partner with us in ministry, you can join us at christianchapel.com give. If there are any needs in your life that we can pray with you about, please drop those off at christianchapel.com prayer. We're praying you have a great week and that you live out the inheritance God has given to you through Jesus.